Okay, so today I'm going to start something new, but it's not going to be part of the exam, okay? So this is called, this is, this is a little bit easier to what we have been doing, but it's going to lead to something that is a little bit more complicated. So it's like a lot of complicated calculations, easy ones, and then we go back to a lot of complicated calculations, no? Whoa. So this is called, <laughs> and then at the end, we combine everything. I mean, people that took this with Radosta, I haven't even mentioned yet the principle of virtual work, no? So you see, the problems you have on the assignment, it's coming. But basically, you have seen that the two problems that I give on the assignments, those are the last two problems that you cover with Radosta in chapter six, which is the last thing you do in class with him, I guess, no? I don't know. Anyway, but you see that you don't need it. It's stuck, so you could do it at the beginning. So anyway, here we're gonna we're gonna look at the wings parts. So we look at the idealized. It's always easy to do the idealized cases. So idealized paper. <laughs> wings part. Okay, so over here, first, a little bit about the sign convention that I'd be, that I'm be using all the time, because I received also <laughs> a question the other day is that for me, if this is a beam, Z is the spine one's direction, Y is like the thickness, and X is like the width of the component, no? They're dealing with, okay? Okay, so if I do a wing spar, in this case, let's see. Always a difficult part for me is the figures. So one, two, one, two. So let's say this is the wall over here. Okay. Okay, so we have this, let's say this will be the flange, the top flange or the top spar, flange one. Flange two over here. So we have two flanges, so let's say this is the easiest, and here will be skin or panel, okay? So this panel over here is gonna be subjected to a force is subjected to a shear force Vy. And let's say a bending moment. So if the bending moment here would be about which axis? If I do the bending here, this would be about X, no? Bending up and down, no? This bending up and down. Okay, so all this stuff is just notation, this figure. So now if I look, so these flanges, Suppose they should only be able to carry loads on the along the members. It will be that would be P1. So we can break this force here into two components that would be, let's say, PY1. And this will be over here. PZ1, and let's call the angle between both of them. I don't use it in my notation, but I think a lot of people use it. I think Radosta use it. Even though that one, I'm not sure. And then here would be P2. We do kind of some, something similar. This would be PZ2. 
and this would be P Y2. And this angle over here would be alpha sub two. Okay, so this is the simple case we can imagine about a wings part that you can have, you know, like two planches on one side and you put a panel in the middle, no? Okay, and this is subjected to a shear force and a bending moment. So we're gonna do two cases. In order to solve this problem. So case one, we're gonna say that the flanges resist All bending moments. And this is generally the case that people consider, okay? is the easiest one, and you will see it's pretty simple. Okay, so in that case, you're gonna have that The force PZ1 will be equal to MX over H and PZ2 will be equal to same thing, MX over H. <laughs> Okay, where well, I don't think I specified here, but I'm gonna to have to specify very quick. Um, so what is H? What do you think is H? Do not, do not put it on the figure. Correct, so it will be the depth of whatever section you find, no? So in this case, it will be H, no? I mean, it's also the line, okay? But it's also, it will be H will be the distance. So basically, does that make sense or not? I mean, okay? Whatever, do you have a bending moment, okay? If you have a force, the only members that can resist this one is the flanges, no? The flanges we say can only resist the loads in what? In one direction, we will be on the, on this here we put PZ1, no? Because it's the Z1, so the moment's about the Z, so it will be now due to the spacing between the moments, okay? So now let's see uh, if we need to put sign. If this is bending the way it is, so this is bending up. So if I do the figure, this will be bending what? This way, no? So point, the flange one should be intentional compression. Somebody said, what should it be? Compression, so you want to come here, compression. I'd rather see you doing this and just put compression, but some people like to use the negative sign up for compression. And then flange two would be what? Tension or positive, no? Do you understand the tension compression? Yes? Okay. All right. So, so that's it. We're going to move to the next thing now. So it would be the easiest case, which is a journey that is assumed in real life. Case two, obviously, is the one that's a little bit more complicated. And this one is 
the panel is fully effective in resisting bending moments. Okay, so if I do a little figure, okay, showing the area of the flanges, it is going to be H. Here will be the thickness of the panel. This is the idealized, so this is flange one. Flange two. So in this case, we're going to say that PC1 is equal to the bending stress at one times the area of the flange one, or B1. And PC2 equal to the stress at point two times B2. OK? You want to compare with if you took it with Radosta, it uses exactly the same thing, but instead of B1 and B2, it uses A1 and A2. Okay. Okay, so here we have the expression for Z1 and Z2 because we know the moment about X, no? Yeah. So it's going to give us PC1, PC2, but we say that for us, the flanges are only able to carry the load in what? In the direction. Of the member, so we really we are really looking looking for what P one and P two, no? Yeah, okay. So how do we do that? So for case two, we keep going. So uh, we need to look at the vertical component. Can you leave that on the screen for a second. What's that? Some uh... this? No. Here, the first term, yeah, sigma, sigma, yeah, it's okay. So, sigma here is what you said before. Sigma is bend distress, which can be that complicated equation that you wanted to use at the beginning. Okay, in this case, you might have to use it again. Okay? okay, bend distress. So I mean, but it's not a matter of flat. Remember, the angle is in function of the bending moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has nothing to do with the structure. Okay. So the structure can be flat. If you apply the bending moments at different angles, then the neutral axis is going to be at a curvature. Okay. Be careful with that. Okay. So really what we're looking for is that first we're going to be looking at is the vertical components. of P1 and P2. So basically what I'm looking, I'm just gonna do a little figure of, I mean, a more detailed figure of this part over here, okay? Which is in red that you see over here, okay? So for that case, what do we have? If I do another figure, we're gonna have here, PC1, This will be P1. Again, this is alpha one. Personally, I don't use it. Okay, but a lot of people use it. And this would be over here. PY1. No. So this is again just an amplification of the figure over here, of this part over here for the flange one. All right. So now we just do some very basic trigonometry. Tangent alpha one will be equal to what? Py one over Pz one, no? Okay. Or this could also be equal to what? 
So let's see. If you remember, this is the Z direction. This is the Y direction, no? Okay. So this should be equal to what? This should also be equal to delta Y sub one. over delta z sub one. So instead of using the angle, I rather use this. So what is the physical meaning of this? Basically means how much has this, you see this is the y, how much is this? What is the angle that will represent the change in, in width or in the taper, no? Yeah? Between this n and this n is a change in the height, no, with respect to the length, no. That they that take into consideration the taper ratio if you want, or some people like to use the angle. I like to use this one here. Okay. I don't know about Rados that this one. I have no idea what he rather use. Okay, so let's say here. So I can see over here now that PY1 will be equal to what? DZ1, tangent alpha 1. Again, that's not the one I like to use. I will say PZ1, delta Y sub 1 over delta Z sub 1. That's what I generally use. OK, if you want, I'm going to do here another small figure. Okay, Oops. that would show what I'm talking about. So let's say it should be our P1, should be our P2. This is here the Delta Z sub one equal Delta Z sub two in our case. And this distance over here will be what? Delta Y sub one. Delta Y sub two, okay? Okay, so over here, this is where it gets confusing a little bit. Okay, what did we say was P1? In our case, we say P1 was in compression, no? Yeah, if it's in compression, P1 would be going up or down? If this is going in the opposite direction, if you plot it here, the Y will be going down, no? Yes, okay. That way structures get complicated because it's not a matter to think about positive, negative. Most of the time it's about thinking about compression and tension. Okay, so we did that for the top one. So we can do similarly. We do the same thing for the lower one. This one over here, okay. So I'm just going to do a bigger figure. So let's see, we have what? PZ2, PY2, P2, alpha 2. So basically, we do exactly the same thing. We're going to get tangent. Alpha two is equal to PY two over PZ two, which would be the same thing as Delta Y sub two over Delta Z two, which will give us PY two 
equal to P Z two tangent alpha two, or this will be P Z two delta Y sub two over delta Z sub two. Okay, so the next part is very easy. So the actual forces P1 and P2 will be equal to what? Simple trigonometry, what should be P1? It's not complete, what should be P1? High school. What is this? It's a triangle. So if you know X and Y, what should be the other one? Pythagoras theorem, no? Okay, and P2 will be the same thing. Okay. All right. So we took we took care of the moment. Now let's look at the shear force. Ready? Okay. So now we're going to look at the shear force. Okay. So if I redo a figure. Very quick. We say we have a shear force going by. I'm going to call it. We know this is external, no? Okay. And now I don't know how to do this plot because always can people get confused, but. Uh, Okay, so, so let's say now this is gonna be resisted by a shear. So this is, remember this is external, this will be internal in the panel. And this is gonna to have to be resisted by what? So in this case, I'm gonna do the forces on the, on the right direction, but I will personally, I will never do it that way. But because PY1, we say, was in compression, no? So top was compression. <clears throat> this one was tension. So this one should be going up the PY, if we use the notation that we use, okay? 
Okay, so personally, and remember this is internal and this is internal, no? So this is the correct figure, but now I want you to think it a bit different. Okay, so now this is the external force, which is going in what direction? It's just going on the y direction, correct? Yeah, now this is the structure, the wing spar. The wing spar needs to resist the, the external forces or so the internal components need to resist the external, no? Yes, does that make sense? Okay, so let me just write over here. Summation of forces, external, need to be equal to the internals. Okay, so from the figure then, what should be the external? By, and this should be resisted by what? So, okay, yeah, so let's say plus py2 minus py1. Okay, so now what happened over here is that because I did the figure correct, what was py1? py1 is really in compression, no? Remember? So if it's in compression, really this term is what? Negative. So really will, will come that because this is compression. This will become what? Py equals to Vp plus Py1 plus Py2. Yes? Okay. Now, what I want you to think is the way I do these problems. Forget about the signs. Okay, forget about the sign because this is correct what we did. But if you ask me the way I look at it, so recommended. Thinking will be what? If you ask me the way I look at it from in my head. If this is what I have. If you give me here something external, okay, all right. What I think about my head is that I don't get the direction. I will do all of them on the same directions. What's important to me is what? Is that Whatever is internal needs to be resisted by the internals, no? I just look at the magnitude, no? Does that make sense or no? Because be careful, because if you use the signs and you do the wrong figure, then you're gonna end up with something wrong. However, if you do this, you know that these three over here, in order to counterreact the external, they need to be equal in magnitude, no? Yeah? Okay, if you hold my hand and I pull in order to resist it, you need to pull with the same force, no? It's basically what I'm saying, okay? This is the way I look at it and you see you end up with the same equation. All right, so let's say over here. This one, this one. So here, the only thing I'm thinking is external needs to be counter-reacted by internal. Okay, so from... Above equation. Now, what can we find? I find that the shear force in the panel should be equal to what? Vy minus, and here I do again the magnitudes, Py1 plus Py2. And I will just take magnitudes. 
All right, I'm gonna put it here. Magnitude, because what happened if you now take PY1 as negative? It's not gonna be right, no? So be careful with the stuff of the sciences. Don't use the science, use common sense. Okay, so now, so I think that now that we have this, Uh, can we go back to one page? I don't want to redo this. Hold on one second. I think it's going to be cleaner. Okay. Can we go here to case one, please? Go here to case one. All right. I think it would be easier. Here you do the idealization again. You do... B1, B2. This is H. And in this case, you're gonna say that Q will be equal to V panel divided by H. Okay. That way you have these two figures. All right. So I want to relate this now to what we're going to be doing next, which is exactly the same thing. For one. Only two pages so far. I'm missing one page. I lost it. I don't know where it is. I mean, not that important. Here it is. Okay. In my page two. In my page, please. Okay, so now that we find DP, just like I said, let me go to the next page. All right. So I'm going to do here. Again, case one. Okay, so which is what? Flanges. Are effective. In resisting. Bending moments what is the figure that we have? We said that p c one was equal to m x over h one would be positive, the other one negative p c two was m x over h. If you want to put this one was in compression, we say negative, but I don't want to put any sign. then we say that. This structure can be idealized by the boom area of the flange one and the boom area of the flange two that are separated by a depth H. And that in the, that case, the average shear flow Q. Over here, we say Q. I just wrote down would be equal to what? VP over H. So I'm going to put over here this is an average <clears throat> shear flow. Okay, and here the 
skin is not effective. So in this one, if you want, in this one, what do you take? You consider that the thickness, the panel does not resist any bending. So you can say that's equal to zero. Case two, panel is effective in resisting bending moment. So in that case, we say that PZ1 was equal to sigma Z1 D1. PZ2 was equal to sigma Z2 B2. Okay, we're over here, since you mentioned at the beginning, Sigma sub Z is the, uh, I think it's called the flexural equation. Uh, is the, let's put it this way, is the direct stress due to bending. Bending most. Okay. But for this one, the shear flow is given in this case by what? You might remember the equation, Q sub S, you always simplify to the same thing, would be instead of minus B, Y would be minus B panel over I, X, X. of YTDS plus the summation of the B sub R Y sub R. So remember, this is the panel thickness. This takes care of the flanges or the stiffness. Okay, and in this case, if you need to do the shear flow distribution, what you're gonna find out is that you're gonna have a constant value over here. And then this will become like this. So here you will see Q over here, this would be the Q sub S <coughs> Okay, and if you wanted to put more stuff, this should be the neutral axis and Y should be the distance from the neutral axis. Okay, so now this is important. If you look at both cues, okay, this is important for the understanding. In real life, 
this is the case that is done. 99.9% of the case, okay? This is more the detailed one, more academic, okay? But what's important is to understand the difference. So let's say, let's say over here, the total area, let's say produced by this force Q and the Q sub L, let's say areas, the so one, yes, areas of the forces here, let's say will be the same. Okay, so basically the area you want produced by the shear flow and the, what's in red here would be the same. Now, what is the problem of calculating this distribution of, instead of this one? What's gonna happen for the Q max? Here, what happened is that here you only had, here you only have for case one, a Q average, no? Okay. However, if you do the real distribution, this part over here might be shorter, but then the maximum value can be higher, no? Yes? So imagine that you just consider this term when you do your design, which is what people do most of the case, okay? This one, and you are missing really the maximum value. Probably you don't remember that, but maybe you do. I'd be surprised. But many times you surprise me, so. Uh, if you did what with bending, do you remember when you did the expression for the expression for bending? I don't know if you remember of the beam. And you did shear, so you did that last semester probably. What is the expression for shear? So that ring the bell. VQ over IT, no? Okay. If you calculated, let's say the shear by being the force divided by the area, you could do it that way as well, no? Okay, for bending, okay? So for bending, you have something similar. You have the tau average over here will give you something like this, but let's say the this one that would be the red one will give you something like this. So the area was kind of the same, but what was the difference just for bending on a rectangular cross section? What is the difference between the maximum and the average? I'm sure you did the division either in what do you think can be give a percentage for a rectangular cross section? What do you think is the difference? You can guess. You think it's a lot, it's not a lot, it's a little bit. Okay, so the tau max you will see that is 1.5 times the average. It's about 50% more. So you need to be careful when you, you need to be careful when you calculate average values instead of real distribution values, no? Okay. So generally the preliminary designs will always be done with average values. And then if there's some part of the structure where they see that is safety factor is not big enough, you can go for more detailed calculations. What is the safety factor? What is it? No, no. What is it? The real, what is in, what is, you need to explain what is the safety factor. Yeah. It's, it's the, I mean, forget about this problem, not saying about this problem, I'm saying in, in general. What is it? It's how much over your expected loads that you plan for uh, in case something weird happens. Okay, so correct. So basically you are saying, I know the loads in this bridge or in this wing are gonna be 10. So instead of doing the calculator and being the load tens, I'm gonna say the loads are 20. So in that case, what would be the safety factor? Two, okay, all right. So in that case, you might take into consideration a lot of those little, little problems that we are observing now, no? Okay, but let's say that you have a part of the structure where it's very critical, and you want to be more detailed. So then you can do more detailed calculations, no? So the problem of aerospace, of aerospace compared to other ones is that when you do the design, you are concerned about the weight, no? So in an aerospace structure, depending on the components, you go to the FARs regulation where you need to certify an aircraft. Probably you did a little bit of that in structures one. You did, you did a bit of FARs, Federal Aviation Regulation, for design, I think you do for the wing, no? 
wing loaded or, or wing loads or something like that. Generally, loads for an aircraft are generally small, generally between 1.2, 1.5, because you need to save on weight. No. If you go to a civil engineering application, do you care about the weight? You're building a dam. What do you think would be a good safety factor for a dam? What do you think they use? I use 20 or 30. No. They couldn't care less, okay? Mm. okay? What do they care about to put two more meters of concrete? No, you're going to be safe, no? Yeah, but the money at this stage, you know, <laughs> is, 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 is forever, <laughs> no? Yeah. So if you break that investment over whatever, 100 years is nothing, it's peanuts. Okay? But in an aircraft, if you say, I'm going to make the wing three times as big, you're going to run into a problem that you won't be able to fly it or it's not going to fly too far, no? Okay? So that's the difference between if you want a civil engineer and an aerospace engineer. You, are a lot, you need to be a lot more details on the calculations because weight is a critical factor. All right? So what I want to say is that be careful when you use average values compared to the exact distribution. This is the type of stuff that you run into. Okay? This type of problems. So let's do one example. One, two, three, four. So these problems are not difficult, okay? And yesterday I had somebody mailing me that they wanted to know how to verify the problems that you had on the assignments with a theme map. It's a bit more complicated, these ones, but this one's actually pretty easy to check. Okay, so probably tomorrow, since I don't want to use, maybe we can do that tomorrow. Since I don't want to start really the new material, it will be a bit more complicated than this. If you have laptops, maybe bring your laptops and we can do validation of these ones using final elements. Okay? All right. So let's do one example. Okay. So in this case, let's consider the a similar flange that the one we just did. So let's say one, two, three, four, one, two, I'll do here. So obviously I'm doing the simple geometry you can imagine for a spar, okay? So flange one, flange two, here is cantilever. Let's say here the depth of the wing spar is 0 0.4 meters. The tip would be 0 0.2 meters. Here is a panel. We're going to make a cut here. There's a force being applied. External force of 20 kilonewtons going down at our weak spar. is two meter long. They give us that the cross sectional area of the flange one equal to the cross sectional area of the flange two is. 400 millimeters square, and that the thickness of the panel is two millimeters. Okay, here I'm gonna add one thing. Remember this is Z, Y, and X. And they ask us to determine Determine the shear flow in the panel. Considering case two and case one. I'm going to start by the case two, which is the longest one, and then we do case one very quick.
Okay, so in this case, I'm gonna start by doing some initial D1 calculation before we really go into the calculation. So here we can say that the cross section or the geometry is symmetric, no? Okay, so this will mean what? Uh, x, y will be equal to zero. Then here we only have a moment about which direction, about which axis. This is creating a moment about only which axis. If you pull here, this is going to rotate about which axis? <laughs> about the x, no? Yes? So you could say that here m, so there is no lateral bending, so m, y will be zero, no? And it would be, if you want, it would be no torsion. If you want, you can put it mz will be zero, no? Does that make sense or no? Okay, so if we do all this stuff, this is gonna simplify the equations quite a lot because then what do we have? Then the equation for bending stress, bending stress will always be in the direction on the actual direction, no? So this is actual on the z is only gonna be due to what? mx and the simplified equation will be what? mxy divided by this is rotating about which axis? Really? About which axis this rotating? Due to the bending moment, mx. This is rotating about which axis? This one? This one or this one? Is bending about which axis? The x. You don't need to know the equation. So moment x. Now the bending moment is gonna depend on what? On the y location, no? Up and down, no? And this, you, I can rewrite the flexural equation, the, the equation just by the understanding. Okay, you don't need to memorize if you have the understanding, no? What is the meaning of i? I think we discussed that at the beginning of the semester. What is the physical meaning? Somebody asked you, what is I? You're gonna say, okay, it's the moment of inertia. Okay, what does it do? I mean, I think somebody knew when I asked that question. The resistive, resistive moment uh, due to mass. Okay, kind of that really is how unlikely is something to rotate about that axis. Okay, so if you have a moment about this, you need to see why it's gonna be unlikely to resist the bending about that axis, no? That's what the I is, okay? All right, anyway, you have this, and then we're also gonna have then our Q sub S, once we use it, we do go to what? Uh, the general equation would be what? Minus of by over I X X, and here we'll have what the y tds plus summation of b sub r y sub r. Okay, that I can think of. Okay, the equation we might need to use. Okay, so you see the quantities we need. We need to find the moment of inertia i x x. So let's find i x x. So moment of inertia. We need to find this. So let's see. In this case, for case, for case two. So we're gonna need really need it for case two. So let's see. What can we say? We could say that i x x. For case two, we need an i x x. Let's say here, F L for flanges plus the I X X due to the, let's say P for panel. So let's say this would be flanges This will be panel, no? Okay. Uh, 
Okay, here I forgot to do, I, I forgot to mention words. So determine the shear flow in the panel, considering case one and case two at the section A, A prime, okay? And let's do section A, A prime over here. A, A prime, that will be right in the middle. So what I'm trying to say is that we need to find the cross-section properties at that location. So this will be A, A prime, the booms of the areas are constant. So this is B1, this is B2. The panel of the thickness is T, two millimeters. What would be the the depth or the height, the H over here. Look at the figure, what should be the H? This is 0 0.2, this is 0 0.4, is right in the middle, this should be? Three. 0 0.3. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now. Okay. So I. Let's see the I X X here. Due to the flanges will be equal to what? How do we find that on the previous problem? What do we do? B sub R times Y sub R squared, no? So this will give us what? B1, one, one squared, B2, Y2 squared, where Y1 and Y2 are equal to what? I need to be careful because I didn't put it. It should be equal to what? Correct, because those should be taken from which location? From the neutral axis, no? So this should be just 0 0.3 divided by 2, so 0 0.15. Okay, so if we do the calculations for this, I'm going to give you that number, the I X X S flanges gives you eighteen ten to the six millimeters to the fourth. Okay, now we need to do the effect of the skin, no? All right. So what would be the I X S, the one that we call sub P for the panel? What is the moment of inertia for something rectangular? One twelve bh cube, no? So here we be equal to what? 112, what would be the base? The thickness and the height would be our H would be H cube. Okay, so if you want here for a bit of calculations, one over 12 times two millimeters times 0.3 meters, how many millimeters would that be? Would be 300 millimeters, which will give you that the moment of inertia of the panel, the influence of the panel will be 4.5, 10 to the 6, 
Mire, mire esto de acá. So once again, so that the total moment of inertia, which is the one of the flanges plus the IXX of the panel, we give you that the total moment of inertia, IXX, will be equal to what? 22.5, 10 to the 6, millimeters to the 4. Okay, guys, remember that in class is the time that you need to ask me as many questions as you want. So if you have questions, ask me. Yes. Are you supposed to what? To do what with H? Say that again. On 300. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so you know how to calculate moments of inertia, no? Okay. All right, so now that we did this one, we can calculate bending moment uh, okay mx I mean, you know I'm how to do this I'm pretty sure so let's say I mean we have our spar if I do it from I mean I could model it like what like I could say that this is the force over here F This is the two meters. I mean, I really go in a lot of details. Johnny, I would not never do this, but I see you're a bit lost, so I don't know, maybe you're not. So what should be the, the distribution of the bending moments for this case? Where would the moment be maximum? What would be the moment at the wall? Really? What is moment? Force times distance, no? So should be zero at two because the force is applied at two and should be maximum at the wall, no? At the more should be equal to what? Whatever it would be F times two, no? What would be the moment at the cut? And in this, at this location, what should be the moment? F times one, no, the R, correct? Yeah, so we could say that MX would be equal to what? F times one, what was F? 20, so it should be 20. kilonewtons per meter, so we have to be careful here. So our max should be equal to what? 20, can I put 10 to the six newtons per meter meter? You multiply by 1000 for the K and one meter is 1,000 millimeters, no? Okay. So now we're going to look at bending stresses due to MX. So in this case, at the beginning, we say that the stresses, the expression will reduce to what? To the expression mx times y divided by ixx, no? Okay, so this is the equation. So if we do this, what should be 
Again, this will be at the cut, okay? Sigma Z1 will be equal to what? Mx, Y sub 1 divided by Ixx, and Sigma Z2 will be equal to Mx, Y sub 2 divided by Ixx. So let's think about it. If this is bending down, the top would be intentional compression. Would be intention, no? But again, so anyway, let's put the values. What, what do we have for MX? MX would be 20, 10 to the 6 newtons millimeters. What would be Y? What do we say was H at this location? Correct. So that would be how many millimeters? So it would be. And at 50 millimeters now, it's the H3 divided by 2, no? All right, and this should be divided by the IXX that we say will be equal to 22.5, 10 to the 6 millimeters to the 4th. So this is going to give us that this is equal to 133.33. We are just going to put three newtons millimeter square. First, I will say tension. Okay. And this one will just be basically the same thing. I can write it down 10, 10 to the six. Newtons millimeters times minus 150 millimeters divided by 22.5 10 to the 6 millimeters to the fourth would be equal to 1, 3, or you can put the negative. Generally, I would not put the negative like I told you, but compression. Okay, so I think we got everything we need in order to do our calculations. Okay, so let's look over here. For case two, go back to your notes. We're gonna do it very quick now. For case two, what do we say will be PZ1? We be equal to sigma Z1 times V1, no? PZ2 will be sigma Z2 times V2. So what is so let's do the first one. So we said it would be 133.3. What is B1? Okay, so we can keep this as 400, <laughs> much as the units. So again, I don't want to use the values, but let's use the values. This will give you 53,320. Newtons, and this one, you want to keep the values minus 53, 320. Remember, I would not like to use the values. I will use tension compression, okay? And then tension <clears throat> compression. So now it's just pure substitution, okay? Into the cases that we did.
for yes. case one, because we did case two first, and then we run case one. This is case two, no? Yeah. But case one would be the moment divided by h. That's it. So case one. We, we didn't do case one. We didn't do anything. This is general calculations. Oh. This is not case one. Okay. This here, the only thing we did is what? Find the moment of inertia, no? Okay. Yeah, and find the bending stress, no? Basically, what I did is find the values that we needed to in order to now start case two. So it would be case two. If you look at the previous notes, so look at it about what we just did before. After we found the pieces, what did we find? We found the expression for the vertical forces, no? We had PY1, PY1 would be equal to what? PZ1 tangent alpha one, I told you, or will be PZ1 delta of Y sub one over Z sub one. And I say that PY2 will be equal basically the same thing, PZ2 tangent alpha two equal to PZ2 delta lambda two over delta Y2 delta Z2. Okay, so here we need to be a little bit careful because this is generally when you do a mistake because it's easy to do a mistake. Uh, let's see, can I do it here? Yeah, go ahead and just do it here. Okay, so this was our general geometry for the cross section. Okay, this is our cut A, A prime. So let's see, what was the depth over here at the wall? 0 0.4 meters, no? Yeah, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, no? Okay, so if you look at that, what would be that distance over here? This should be 200, 200, no? Yes? Now, the one additive we say was 100, so it would be 100, 100. <clears throat> How much should it be at the middle, at the cut? 150, 150, no? Okay, now here's the part that you do the mistakes that are part of the figure. Uh, this should be here, that distance here should be your delta Y. Okay, as I put on the figure. And that distance here should be your Delta C, no? Okay. So it can be can be multiple ones. So let's see. For me, like I told you, I do the delta Y1, I do as delta Y delta C. This should be equal to what? So basically the ten, the change in temper ratio. What? This could be equal to what? I remember this would be here. One so one thousand millimeters. We do everything in millimeters, and this will be two thousand. No, so there's multiple ways to do the taper ratio. What could be one of them? You could do what? What is the change in taper ratio between the root and the tip? No, it should be two hundred minus one hundred. Correct. Divided by how much? Delta Z would be 2,000, no? Okay, or you could have done what? 200 minus the 150, but this time divided by how much? 1,000, no? It's the same thing. So you do this calculation, you get that this one is equal to 0 0.05, okay? You can use either one, or you could have done even the one from this one to the end, but I was running out of space.
Okay, and basically, all right. You get that. The second one is the same thing is equal to the same by symmetry, no? The one of the lower flash. Okay, so if we substitute into the above calculation, so substituting, into py1 and py2, what are you going to get? py1 equal to what? Uh, 53,320 times 0 0.05 will be equal to 2,666 newtons. PY2 will be nearly 53, 320 times 0 0.05. Again, I will not use nearly values. 2666 newtons. We'll put nearly. Okay, but I will use, I will not put values here, okay? Otherwise, you're going to get, you remember that one. I mean, put a minus if you want, but. They will have to be careful. Okay. So at the end, the actual load P1 and P2 are equal to what? P1 are equal to PY1 squared plus PZ1 squared, square root. P2 equal to PY2 plus PZ2 squared. And if you do this calculation, you get 53, 386.6 in tension and 53, 386.6 in compression. Okay, so, okay, all this is just direct substitution. No, that's why I'm going a bit fast. So now page eight, remember that's the one I told you use more of the common sense, okay, than equation. So let's say shear force. VP, that's what we're doing next. So in our case, I told you that the easiest way would be always assume what are the four, two over here. Okay, in this case, what is our external force? The 20 kilonewtons. And then maybe, I don't know if I need to do that. I'm going to do it here a little bit on the top because maybe you need that help. What is the value of the shear force along the whole length of the beam? It's constant, no? Yeah, so I just put in case, so at section A, also B20, no? Okay, now this is the external. This one needs to be counter-reacted by what? By one of the panel, no? Plus another one of P Y2. And here is one, you know, I could mean this one could actually be going down. 
if I want to do the correct, but if I do everything like I told you on the second case, and I do this one PY1, this should be all the what? The internals. So what should be the easy way to write down this equation? You do summation of forces external should be counter-reacted by everything internal, no? So really the top one, no, PY2 should be on the opposite direction. But again, it doesn't matter because we're not going to do it by looking at the figure. So what are we saying here is that 20 kilonewtons need to be counter-reacted by what? PY1 plus PY2 plus VP, no? I just look at the magnitudes, correct? All right, so... From here, we can find that then VP will be equal to what? Let's say we be equal to 20 kilonewtons minus PY1 minus PY2. So this will give us what? VP equal to 20,000 newtons minus, forget about the, the values, PY1, what do we find for PY1? Minus 2,666. And here you need to be careful. I mean, if we use the same notation that I did on the class note, I put this, so maybe let's change it. Minus plus 2,666. Do you understand this? What I'm saying is that the internal need to counter-react the external, no? Yeah, I'm not looking at the signs. I'm just doing common sense. So this will give you that V of the panel will be equal to 14,668 newtons. Okay, then we're going to look at the Shear flow in the panel. So we say we'll be equal to what? We say that the expression, let me just do a figure here. B1, B2. Neutral axis. From here, we start calculating Y. We're gonna start from the top. This is gonna be S. We know this is 150. I just wanna make sure I finish guys, okay? I know I'm rushing a little bit, but we say what was the expression here for Q? One, two will be equal to minus B Y. In this case will be minus VP over I X X. And then we have the expression YTDS plus summation B sub R Y sub R. So if you do this calculation, this will give you Q12. So VP will be, we just calculated, will be minus 14,000. 668 divided by IXX that we found to be equal what 22.5 10 to the 6. Now is when we need to be a little bit careful here. Maybe I'm going to use different colors. What should be Y? Remember, Y we start from the top, no? And we go now to the natural axis. So what should be Y? And we did this one a lot the other day. So then times T, this two will be the T times BS. And now here we started from B1. So it will be B1, that is 400. So this is B1. And what should be Y1? Y1 
150. Okay, so I'll just give you here some equations. If you do the calculations, it will give you Q12 equal to negative 6.5210 to the minus 4 times minus S square plus 300 S plus 60,000. Okay, but here what's important is what? Is that if you get, if we need to do the figure, what would that figure look like? How should that figure look like? Would this one be the average value? This would be the real distribution. Real. This would be the real distribution should have this shape. So if you do at, if you do here Q12, at S equals zero, it gives you 39.14. So that means this value here is 39.14 and it should be maximum at which value? Right at the middle, at the neutral axis. And this one is equal to 53.8. So this value here should be 53.8 at the neutral axis. And I'm gonna request from you one extra minute or two extra minutes and that you do one calculation for me. Are you done with this? Yes? Okay. So now, let's see. So we did all this stuff for case two. Now, what would be the calculation for case one? For case one, what do we say was Q? The Q average would be equal to what? Mx over h. What is Mx that we calculated? I don't have it anymore. Let's see. How much? I mean, no, 133.33. So, no, that's the stress. Sorry, You're, you might be right. The moment was 20. Yeah, but that's not it. So what did we do? Was the Q, was it MX or was it the, the stress? Uh, let's look back at the note because maybe I'm going too fast here. Case one, what did we say was Q for case one? MX over H. Okay, yeah, so that's what it is. No, yeah, so it's VP over H. So, sorry, you see this, this. So, Q average would be VP over H. That what did we find for VP? 14,668. Yeah, 68. And we need to divide that by what? By the total depth that at that location was what? 300, so how much is that? Can somebody do that calculation for me, please? How much? 48.89, and it will be Newtons per millimeter. So basically now, if we look at the distribution of this one, this is gonna give us what? An average value of, Forty-eight point eight nine. So in this case, it's not bad. In this case, we'll be missing the value, the maximum by how much? The maximum will be fifty-three by about four newtons per millimeter. No, I mean that can be a lot because we're talking per millimeter. No. So you see the difference about one and the other. Okay. 
So guys, remember tomorrow probably what I'm going to do is the final element of, of all this stuff. So if you have laptops, bring them over. If not, I will just do the video, okay?